have that we're all trying to do public good, try and help the marginalized, and we use all sorts of approaches. But I would like to suggest that the only road out of poverty or disparity or inequality is through business enterprise. You're going to help the poor, and definitely, it is not through welfare. It's never worked anywhere or religion. I tell my friends who believe in God, God is on the beach in Phuket. <laughs> He's not looking after you. So you have to help yourself. Next is that this kind of establishing foundations and associations like we did before and have to go around begging for money. Why not take a different road? The best alternative is to start a social enterprise. And of course, in the early days, you pay tax. And move down the road towards financial sustainability. NGOs cannot survive without money from somebody else. You have to keep on begging and life is getting more difficult. Foundations or uh, association. So one answer is definitely social enterprise. And let me conclude right now, in case we have to stop me, that social entrepreneurship should be taught in all schools, starting in private school. And that's what we're trying to do right now. The only way to do it, it solves so many problems. It stops people from migrating because they have no job. If you teach them how to do business in primary school, have a load of fun in all the schools, and the school must also get parents out of poverty, not put them into poverty. And that's what social enterprise can do, but it should be done through schools. The school should be a gateway for economic and social advancement in all aspects of change. So that is basically where I'm leading to. But my own experience began 24 years ago in social entrepreneurship because I knew I could not depend on the donor giving me money forever. Nobody could help us forever. Not even the Roman Empire or the British Empire could last forever. And so the first pioneering activity was begun in 1974 after I established the PDA, the Population Community Development Association. Soon after that, started the first company, which was in fact a social enterprise, but the law doesn't recognize it. We just did it when no profits were given out to anybody at all. It was only reinvested or used to expand or for charitable activities. Now, we classified our work into two categories. The first one was what we call optimization of profit. And the second one was maximization of profit. Yes, we must make a profit, otherwise we go bankrupt. But what sort of profit and what we do with the profit? The optimization of profit is that businesses that we do with people who are poor, and this where it's little, very little profit in it, and it grows very slowly, it's a bit like a bonsai business. It grows very slowly. Whereas the maximization profits, you work with people who have money, and there's good profit, and money grows, and you can use the profits from here to help the optimization profit get started, or to help expand, or to do other charitable activities that you believe in. Now, in both types of businesses, profits are really used to reserve business expansion and charitable activities. That's all. You don't give out to anyone. And we've been doing this and paying, unfortunately, 35% tax. But it's better than doing nothing because associations, but there are ways of minimizing tax without cheating. <laughs> and here's an example we began in the area of family planning. We, were, we wrote a proposal, the government didn't want to do it, but we thought that Thailand needed to, because we had seven kids with a family, and we needed to, to slow down. And so, we were able to get bills and money from the International Pan Parenthood Federation, and we charged only one third of market price. We could do that, we got, we got the bills free, and we got money to run it. But people paid one third of the price. So we got cash for five years, and pills for 10 years. So after five years, we didn't need any more cash because money was earned from the very, very low price that we charged. And here's a typical village distributor. In most Western countries, you needed a doctor, but we had one doctor for 110,000 women. No way. 
couldn't serve the women in, in all areas. So we eventually went to this and got permission after a lot of difficulties from the Ministry of Health to get distribution in the villages. So we call this community-based distribution and we're able to cover the whole country and people uh, uh, got their pills and found out, but mostly pills. And what about people who couldn't afford? Well, we'll see about that. So in the floating market, you could also get the pills and found out. And you can also get in taxis. And for those who could not help, could not earn money, didn't have money, they could pay in community service. But what's important that we had a very strong public education program. It wasn't just putting pills out there. We had to do a lot of work. Condoms speak out everywhere, and even teachers. We trained 320,000 rural school teachers to understand family planning, to be involved in convincing parents, and we had teachers come down growing championships throughout the country to show that the condom is clean if your mind is not dirty. <laughs> and women who could not afford the pill could do community service and get the pill. Why should only be money be good? Can't decent elements be good as well? And so what's, this is what happened. After the government joined in between 1974 and 2015, from seven kids down to 1.5, population growth rate 3.3, and now I'm the culprit. Because all the problem of having too many old people. <laughs> but the answer, the, the, the answer I share, we already heard. We have so many people in Thailand already who would be very good ties. I would like to give some citizenship to them in exchange for some of the ties who already have citizenship. <laughs> and so we have all the people ready. And what is who is who are the ties? We are a fruit salad. Look at me. My father comes from all over the place, but he's called a Thai. My mother's from Dublin. And we don't have all the people here. We have all sorts of blood. And that's what Thailand is about. Even with a bit of royalty sitting up there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, this is what happened. Again, it, and this is an approach, social enterprise approach, which changed the face of Thailand. So don't, uh, underestimate what social entrepreneurship can do. We use a very simple system that the people involved, the government eventually agreed to it, and the government took the same thing. And this is the population to compare the two countries the same. In 1970, <coughs> Philippines and Thailand, 36 million. But today, Thailand, 69 million, the Philippines, 107. We have our different difficulties, but it just shows you what social enterprise uh, can do. And then other examples of the, the two types of the optimization and maximization. The optimization healthcare, family planning, clinics, everything else was all optimization. If you couldn't afford it, you can do community service, but some people had money to pay. So we covered our costs. We didn't have big profits at all. That was not the purpose. It was to be operational, not to have a loss. And this is interesting, chicken raising, where we got we wrote a proposal for funding uh, from, from a German organization, foundation, free them from hunger campaign, and we got the villagers in to take care of the chicken. We loaned them the money, we owned the building, we provided the loan fund, and then each family took care of 300 chickens, rotating. And we have several of these. So they would learn how to raise chickens here, and they took 70% of the profits, and we took only 30. And so this is our first effort. It, it went very well. However, before long, after three and a half years, chicken uh, uh, business was not so good because prices of chicken feed went up so high. So we stopped it. We said goodbye to the chickens. But what to do next? You see, nothing. This is not a rosy road. It, it's, it's rough. So social enterprises have difficulties. So what do we do? We close down, go away. No, firstly we sent away the chickens, and then we improved it, the building, getting ready to bring in machines. I had to go around begging companies to bring their machines out, and I found the labor, got all the organization, the infrastructure, and all they need was to bring their pieces machines out. And so here they're all making Nike shoes and so on, and what was very important, very attractive rental prices. Now we 
I like the Thai plant. We didn't make much money, only a bit. But it was the people who made the money. That was the whole thing. And here is the optimization profit. We did not make a lot. We had a margin, a, a small margin, but the major winner were the people. And this one happened. 15,000, mostly women, did not have to leave home. Normally you would take people to machines. We said, let's bring machines to people. And they could work in there. And they, they didn't have to migrate. And it was fantastic. But nothing lasts forever. Here the problem came in. A Thai government, some time ago, came in and said, we want to win more votes, so minimum <laughs> labor cost, we'll give you 300. Yeah. Some people liked it, but some people lost their jobs. And some of the companies went to Vietnam, Cambodia, and so on, but some stayed. So what do we do with it? Took a lot of time. So we decided, so these were the remaining buildings that kept, and the, the factory stayed, the company stayed, making many things. But for those that went, we took the roof off, put a new type of roof, now you're doing new type of upmarket, vegetables, maximization of profit. So we don't know what's going to happen next, but we have to be prepared. <laughs> so here is an example of you have to be alert, just like any business, right? Uh, then the other one, this is maximization profit, was mentioned earlier on, captures and condoms, where we say our food is guaranteed not to cause pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> if you know anywhere where food causes pregnancy, let me know, please. <laughs> and so this is also cutting our back up. We have 19 in Thailand, we have two in England, one in Oxford, one in Chiangnam. And we want to have one in front. There's a town there called Condom, near Marseille. We would like to go and have a shop called Condom there, get some more French people to come over. <laughs> and so we have some shops that go with the restaurants. We maximize profit. We have certain resorts. This is a Patia called Birds and Bees. It's all related to sex, <laughs> but in a very nice way. Birds and Bees. Yet a lot of you are too young to understand what Birds and Bees means. But uh, ask your parents, don't tell you what it means. It's related to the lie about sex. And there it is. And then what about social enterprise? The approach to it in rural development. And so this is where we have been concentrating our work for about 20 something years. And here's an example. These households wanted, they had rain, but they had no catchment. So we, we again got, went to some funding agency and got the money and said, we will build it for you. You bring, you, you do the labor and you pay for the materials, raw materials, over two years. And so we had the money back. That was agreed at the revolving road fund. But then for those who could not afford to do it, and uh, so we, that, we put the well up and pumped the water up and they came and collected from their, their, their wheels, the trucks and wheels, and paid the money into it. And that amount of money paid for the electricity, and the, the surplus went to build a road fund to be a social enterprise in that village. See, how we turned from the original grant into this, and into an income source, and building up a social enterprise from the surplus. And that we kept on going. So we said that if you want to do water, it should not be only for health, so water to be for health and wealth creation. You can do both. And it's good to have to, to have good health, but it's good to have a, a, a full stomach also. And here that's then expanded so that we pumped up and people paid for water and the amount of water, the amount of money they paid went towards setting up a microcredit loan fund as a social enterprise and they could borrow money to do other businesses. So this was the beginning of how to use the development funds that usually is better than not into a social enterprise. And then this went to water supply system. On the left is by Coca-Cola, on the right is Philip Morris in the stock market, um, and people paid for water. And this amount of money, they didn't have to do the investment. They paid for the, for the water, and the, the amount of money that was used, that was paid, after deducting electricity management, went to help to set up a loan fund, a microcredit loan fund. So we've built over 1,200 
uh, micro credit loan funds in, in the villages and helping to do rolling in rural communities in the form, so we've done about 1,000 uh, 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 so-called village development bank. They're not real bank, they're loan fund as a social enterprise. Uh, and so people, who do we go to? We went to people who knew how to make money. Business community, and they have cash and business skills. So the community is very strongly involved. They must participate. They must organize the loan fund. Any money coming in must be repaid in tree planting. Every tree is worth 100 baht. So if they give you 500,000 baht, you have to find 5,000 trees. A million baht, 10,000 trees. And after 30 years, the trees are worth more than a million baht. And you have our barefoot MBA. Not MBA like Satsin or Tamazan. This is barefoot MBA. You need to learn how to do business at the village level. And then you can borrow. And the banks are not half by women. And they pay 1% uh, per month interest. And the half the profits go back, and the other half are used for health and education and elderly care, as decided by the villagers themselves. And so that some of the loans are used for vegetables, chilies, uh, mushrooms, flowers, crab meat. And now we've been doing it through schools. We've now discovered that the best way to get development going is through schools, and I, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, so this is now being done in about 180 schools. And we believe that the school welcomes it, the students welcome it. They learn and, and to get development activities going through schools. So we do it based on the, the model of the bamboo school, uh, where the school uh, acts as a gateway to improve the quality of life and income in surrounding villages. And so the community is involved. And then the students are the major players. The first one we do is to get agriculture going. We have a loan fund in the school for the students and parents, but all the activities are done by students and parents. They're now learning. These are primary school kids. They're doing things that many villages have not seen before. And they're very excited. All of these are sponsored by companies. And you can deduct five from your tax. It comes through our organization. So they do this at school and at home. All green. People walking by after three weeks see that the school has changed. We don't start off with teacher training. We start with getting kids to do the revolution, the parents involved, and then the teachers. And then we help to set establish a social enterprise in the school and we start <coughs> teaching. And now I'm trying to develop a special curriculum or, or, or let's say refine a curriculum for primary school and secondary school. So if you, you want to help, please come. Maybe Tamasan and July can also write curriculum for primary school and secondary school. But for university, it's too late. We're going to start down there. The hope is down there, not up here. <laughs> and here's the prime minister visiting the school. And it's the student explaining. We have a very simple rule. Teachers must not explain when business come. Get the students to explain it. They do a very good job. They're explaining about pollination to the prime minister. I don't think they know that he knows understand sex. <laughs> <laughs> and so the whole idea, education not for a piece of paper, but education for income generation and a, a few other things to, to be relevant. So all the kids are now able to grow agriculture. And here's a place in Krabi. They said, we can't grow vegetables, it's on stone. We said, yes, you can. And we use these PVC containers and cement rings. And you can grow vegetables. And there's a road run for parents as well as for children, but you must start off with uh, uh, a savings. And so kids can now borrow money and do business. And of course, Thai food going around the world. We're not preparing our future chefs for the world. We're starting in primary school. These are what we call preparatory school. We have preparatory school, military academy. Why not for teachers? Why not for chefs? Why not for hotel? Why do we have to wait until after to finish? Uh, 12th grade, we can start in secondary school or primary school. We have to rethink education for survival. <coughs> and then here's a, a third grade girl growing melon. And here they're melons. They can do this and it's worth a lot of money. And so my conclusion is that social entrepreneurship should be taught and practiced in all schools beginning primary schools. In Thai, I call it 
turn it into bank fund because we suck it because I'm from nobody understands it. Not even the government. So I call it Turing is Magnifying. Simple. It's business and charity. Thank you.